Brother John, the remarks you said at the table, for Brother Terry, your prayer. So what is, what are Christians on about this time of year? What is it? If you didn't know, what, what is this thing? Everybody's celebrating and some churches have special services and there's pictures of babies and what is this thing about? What is it? Well, it's about something called the doctrine of incarnation. This doctrine is taught most succinctly in Luke, the first chapter, the text I have on the wall that we read quite often. It says that the Holy Spirit would come upon Mary and that she would be with child and that this child would be known as the Son of God. The doctrine of incarnation is embodied in a document that was written in about 300 AD. It pretty accurately describes it. This document says that Christ, speaking of Jesus Christ, was incarnate, was made human, was born perfectly of the Holy Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit, by whom he took body, soul, and mind, everything that is in man truly and not in semblance. You might say, well, isn't that, doesn't everybody believe that? You know, for a long time now, Christianity has been pretty solid, solidly accepted the doctrine of incarnation. It wasn't so initially. About three or four hundred years, there was a lot of debate about it. But uh, until about 150 years ago, it was pretty commonly accepted. Unfortunately, these last 100, 200 years, there have been a lot of debate about this doctrine of incarnation. Now, of course, those outside of Christianity do not accept it. They do not believe that Jesus Christ was God, that he was born a man, that he lived, he died, was buried, and was resurrected all the while being both the son of God and the son of man. They don't believe that. The Baha'i faith, the Buddhist, Buddhist faith, Hindu, Islam, they, they, Judaism, of course, they don't believe it. Unfortunately, there are more and more Christians that no longer accept it. I did some research this last few weeks. Even within uh, denominations such as uh, some of the American Lutherans no longer accept the virgin birth, no longer accept that this was God in the flesh. Swiss reform, some branches of the Presbyterians, some branches of the Episcopal Church, even the, the United Churches of Christ. That's, it's really disturbing. You might say, well, Mike, why does this matter so much? What's the deal? Well, of all the doctrines talked about in the Bible, this is one that there's a lot of ink on this subject. Now, the last four years, I have, it's my turn to speak on fourth Sunday in December. I have talked about this subject. You may remember we've covered second John. We covered Philippians chapter two. We covered Colossians chapter one. We've talked about this doctrine from scripture and the scripture has a lot to say about it. Today, we're going to look in Hebrews, the second chapter. I happen to be going through Hebrews and I rearrange the order of what I'm doing so I can hit that topic today in Hebrews, the second chapter. It's talked a lot about a lot in scripture, this doctrine of incarnation, that Jesus Christ was God, that he came to be born as a man. And if you wanted to summarize the doctrine, it sort of summarizes in these bullets, that Jesus Christ pre-incarnate was divine. That before he was born as a man, he was equivalent to God, Philippians 2. That it was truly a virgin birth, that that's not some sort of a, a way of saying something else, that Mary had not been with a man, that Mary was... Um, that the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and that is how she came to be with child. That God, that Christ while he was on earth was both fully God and fully man. That he was every bit God, every bit man. That, but while he was man, he subjected himself to the conditions of being a man and all the things that that means. That Jesus Christ really died. The son of God died on the cross. His heart stopped beating that it's not a ghost up there that it's not the figment of somebody's imagination like so many in christianity now want to say that jesus christ really died and yes that is shocking that god would die that jesus christ really three days later came back to life never to die again a new kind of life that he was literally resurrected this is the doctrine of incarnation, all parts of it. We think about the birth this time of year, but there's much more involved in it, that Jesus, God, became flesh. Now you might say, Brother Mike, can't you just talk about, you know, authority and religion or patience or some other thing that we need, you know? Well, 
first of all, John thought this doctrine was so important in 2 John that he said, you know, this is a hill to die on. You know, we talk about that sometimes. Disagreements we have within Christianity, we struggle things, we think differently and all, and, and, and it's good that we should struggle. We shouldn't just go to our corners without thinking about it. That's, that's fair. But there are some things that are, as, as you might describe, as non-negotiable. There is no negotiation. And this is one of them. Listen to what John says about the subject of Christ coming in the flesh. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is a, the deceiver and the antichrist. He goes on to say, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. John is not ambiguous in what he says about the doctrine of incarnation. And I want to explore with you just a moment why I think it matters so much. I believe that when people begin to move away from the authority of Christ and the apostles, when they fail to understand that the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the apostles are authoritative and that we should follow them, when, when people begin to make that step, that step actually began right here. A failure to recognize that Jesus Christ was not just a man, that he was God in the flesh, the creator walking around the Sea of Galilee, and that that creator empowered 12 other men to teach his doctrine, and that those doctrines are doctrines directly from the creator. I believe any rejection of authority or failure to recognize Christ and apostles' authority begins right here, and that's why it's so important that we look at Jesus and we don't just see a great teacher or another man or a great prophet. We see God, and that informs how we view him and his teachings. You see, if Jesus Christ is not God, then so many of the things he said are not true when he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's not true if Jesus is not God. If he's not God in the flesh, as often is said, he was either Lord, it's all true, or he was a liar, or he's a lunatic. And you this morning are faced with that same decision, whether you want to make it or not, by default you will. You will leave here this morning confessing that he's either Lord he was a liar or he was a lunatic. And it all comes down to this question. Was he born in the flesh, God, born in the flesh as Jesus Christ? No, I think this doctrine is very central, central to who we are as Christian people. And it matters a lot. And so many things in Christianity flow out of this truth. So we're going to go through this text in Hebrews this morning. We've been going through Hebrews anyway. We're going to go through this text and this text happens to be filled with teaching about the incarnation. It's two slides. We'll read the text. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now I'm putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside his control at present. We do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should be made the founder of their salvation, or should make the founder of their salvation perfect, through suffering, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell you, I will tell of you, I'm sorry, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing praise, and again, I will put trust in him, and again, behold, I and the children that God has given me. Therefore, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps 
the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this word that you have given us. Help us now as we unravel this word and we look at this truth that it becomes real to us, that we see Jesus, we see him as God and our brother, and that that informs how we think, how we live, how we act, and how we feel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We've pointed out the book of Hebrews was written from Rome to the city of Jerusalem, Christians in Jerusalem. These Christians were made up of a lot of people that you might not realize on a, just a quick notice, but if you go to the book of Acts, you realize that the Christians in Jerusalem were made up of a good many Pharisees, made up of priests, were made up of those that were zealous for the law, Acts 21. So the people in Jerusalem had been practicing Jews. And, you know, I'm not sure, what did, did I think there was a bunch of Roman citizens there, you know? No, that's who would be there in Jerusalem, right? A bunch of converted Jews to Christianity. Now, you've got to remember, these Jews were about to lose everything culturally that meant everything to them. That city in 70 AD is going to be destroyed, and Christ had predicted that. Meanwhile, they had begun to slip away from certain doctrines regarding Christianity, and one of them was the incarnation. They'd begin to doubt the incarnation as witnessed by the things that the Hebrew writer wrote to them. There's three texts that deal specifically with the incarnation, very specifically. And so the Hebrew writer is writing this letter knowing they're about to lose all of the trappings of Judaism. They need Christ more than ever. And so he is reaffirming to them certain fundamental truths about Christ. And it's so important in our world, in our culture, that we hang on to them as well. Because we live in a world that at any minute, it feels like it, could come crumbling apart. And all that we would have and all that we need to hold on to is Christ and the promises of Christ. And that's why this letter is so relevant to us. The book of Hebrews deals with five subjects. That Christ is better than the angels and the law that the angels delivered. Christ is better than Moses and the promise that Moses prom made promise, but they never saw. Christ is better than the Levitical priesthood. Indeed, he's a priest after a different priesthood, the priesthood of Melchizedek. Christ's sacrifice is better than the sacrifices of the old law. And the faith that the fathers had is ultimately and only realized in Christ Jesus. And in these five ways, Christ is better than those things. So why would you hold on to those things? Each of these five topics are dealt with in three ways. First, a thesis is offered. That thesis states sort of a, the central theme of what he's trying to say. Then there's a whole body of proof, mostly going through the Old Testament, proving his point. And then there's always a warning, and some of the warnings are quite lengthy, explaining how that you've got to accept this truth. That there's a, a fall. You could fall away if you don't embody this truth. We began with... <clears throat> When we began this study several months ago, we began with that opening three verses, this, if you will, this uh, prologue, the seven wonders of Christ. The book really is a commentary on those seven wonders. And those seven wonders ends with this first thesis statement. That is that having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. That's the thesis then that the first two chapters will answer. Christ is better than the angels. And if you just read Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, there's a lot about angels. And that's what is going on there. Christ is greater and better than the angels. He's not an angel. He's better than the angels. Now, this section of proof begins here uh, really right away in chapter 1, but we're looking specifically at the portion over in chapter 2. We, time will not allow for us to cover every square inch of the book of Hebrews. So think this through for a moment. Imagine you were a Jew, and you received a letter that said, Hey, you guys have lost sight of who Christ is. Let me reaffirm to you, Christ is greater than the angels. He's over and above the angels. Now, a person that knew the, the old covenant would probably go in their mind straight to Psalms chapter 8. And Psalms chapter 8 talks about man who was made a little lower than the angels. And he quotes it there. He says, it has been testified somewhere I'm curious why he said somewhere. Why didn't he just say the psalm? Other places he would say the psalm, but he, maybe he didn't have the scroll of psalms handy and he had forgot where it was, but he could sure quote it. Testified somewhere, and he's, he's quoting from Psalms 8. 
What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? For you made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now imagine if you were a Jew, and you'd say, wait a minute. If Jesus became a man, and Psalms 8 says men are a little lower than angels, how could it be that Jesus is greater than the angels? How could that be? Well, you know what? That's a fair question. That's a question that's informed by a knowledge of the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant does say, Psalms, there in Psalms 8, that man was made a little lower than the angels, made to be or forced to be a little lower than the angels. That's a good question to ask. So the Hebrew writer is going to go about answering that question. How is it that Christ could be greater than the angels but also be a man who the Bible says is lower than the angels? That's a, like I said, that's a very, very good question. And that's what this next body of text is going to, it's going to deal with that question. Well, the first thing the author of Hebrews does is he says, first, let's, let's talk about what's going on in Psalms 8. Psalms 8 is a divine commentary on Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 talks about the created order. And in the created order, man is given dominion over all of God's creation. He's given charge over God's creation. You read that over in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Now the psalmist, David, is writing about that subject, which is no surprise. You remember from Deuteronomy, the kings were required to read the law and copy it out. And David did that. And as he read the law and copied it out, he learned the law. And as he did that, he began to write psalms about his conclusions. Psalms 19 is one of those. Psalms 8 is one of those. Psalms 110 is one of those. There are several of those where David is looking at the created order, the things that happened in the first several chapters of Genesis, and he's writing psalms specifically about those events. Well, Psalms 8 is one of those. Here's the created order. God creates the world, creates man. Man is the pinnacle of creation, gives man dominion over the creation. And David writes about that and says, well, man was made a little lower than the angels. The word made is important. It doesn't mean that he was created that way. It doesn't mean he was forced to become that way. And what the Hebrew author is telling us is that this was something that was subjected upon man. It wasn't that way originally. Man was created to be over the creation. Now, if you're doubting that we are no longer over the creation, let me ask you, who in here, who in here has complete control of the coronavirus? <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody does. Or go wrestle with an alligator and see how that turns. Let me know how that works out for you. Or how about your own anger? You got control of that? God created us to have dominion over this creation, but listen to what the Hebrew writer says. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. It's not that way. That's right. It's not that we have some control. We have a couple of rabbits. I think we think that we control them. I'm not sure if they control us. Maybe you have some pets or a garden or things that you... We have some control. But somewhere along the way, man has lost that status that the Hebrew writer is talking about. Now listen to how he says this. I want to back up and look at that. Now, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. Every created thing that's important every created thing we're supposed to have dominion over but it's not that way right now something happened Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden we lost that and in that process we were made subjects of death and therefore made to be lower than the angels and you know what that infers that before sin, man was not lower than the angels. And I believe that's exactly what the Hebrew writer is saying. And I think we'll see that here in just a moment. That man was created over all of God's creation, Adam and Eve. 
this paradise existence that they were given. But when man sinned, we were made lower than the angels. We were subject to death. So he's explaining this to the person that has written that, that has posed that question, how can Christ be, you know, a man and be lower than the angels? And the, and the author is essentially saying death is what caused that. And Christ had to die. And that's sort of his next thing. Now, before I get into that, though, I want to think about something for a moment because this is important to where we're headed. God created you and I to have dominion over the universe, and we currently do not. And what does that say about God's sovereignty? Did somebody arm wrestle with God and beat him? Is somebody stronger than God? What, what happened that, that, that undid what was God's sovereign will? His sovereign will was that we be created to have dominion over the universe. And now it's not that way. You know, people ask this question all the time in a different way. They'll say, how can an all-powerful God allow so much evil in the world? You know, a lot of times Christians are afraid of that question. No, that's exactly the right question to ask. That is the right question to ask. How can this be? That's what the Hebrew author is asking. How can this be? That God created the world to be a certain way and it's not that way. How can it be that God created you and I to have dominion over everything he created and it's not? I don't even have control of my own faculties sometimes. Han and I overslept this morning. We, you know, I guess we lost a little control. We overslept. There's so many things that we don't have control, isn't there? It's not God's will. God's will is that we be in control, that we be over everything. And, and you know what's not that way? God's sovereignty was challenged at the Garden of Eden. It wasn't just that you and I sinned. God's sovereignty was challenged. And he will make it right. So that's the first thing you've got to know about this text. God's sovereignty has been challenged and it must be made right now watch how it says this at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him but we see him you see that hebrew author is posing two statements right now we don't see everything in subjection but what we do see so there's something going on in the interim that is a process to make things right what we do see, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Yeah, the Hebrew writer says, yeah, Jesus was for a little while made lower than the angels. Yes, Psalms 8 is correct. For a little while, a short time, 33 some odd years, he was made lower than the angels. But when Christ came out of the grave, that status changed. He conquered the grave, and in conquering the grave, what does it say? He has been crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. He went into the grave and defeated the grave and came forth. You see why the doctrine of incarnation must be true, or all of Christianity crumbles to the ground. If God does not die and come back to life, his sovereignty remains challenged. Satan remains a victor. If God does not die and come back to life, and in so doing, defeat the very ground that Satan holds, <clears throat> God's sovereignty is only resolved in the incarnation. Only resolved. His sovereignty is only made right if God becomes flesh, dwells among men, dies, and comes out of the grave alive, never to die again. If you don't believe in the doctrine of incarnation, neither do you believe in the doctrine of God's sovereignty. Because they must go together. Number two in this text, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. God created Adam and Eve and gave them dominion 
over his creation because he loved them. He loved them and he wanted to bless them and he did bless them. And now they stand to be destroyed because they sinned. God's mercy is now drawn into question. God can no longer have love and mercy toward Adam and Eve. No, he's got to destroy them. If his sovereignty remains unchallenged, it must be destroyed. They must die. Except in the death of Christ, since he was God in the flesh, and since he became man, now God looks at that death and says, the grace of, through the grace of God, I will count the death of my son in place of the death of Adam and Eve and their descendants. You've heard pe preachers here talk about this as the doctrine of penal substitution or substitutionary atonement. So it's just a fancy way of saying he died in my place. My sins are put on the cross. And so not only is the sovereignty of God established in the incarnation, but also the grace of God is established in Christ dying at the cross. If God does not come in the flesh, if God does not die at the cross, if that death does not count in place of my sin, then you can know, if you don't believe in that doctrine, you neither believe in the doctrine of God's mercy and grace because God's mercy and grace is only available in conjunction with his sovereignty if you accept Christ, the Son of God, dying as Jesus, the Son of Man. This is why this doctrine is so important and why it is so bad that so many in Christianity are walking away from it because Christianity hangs by the thread of this doctrine. Then he says, For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should, be, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies are, and those who are sanctified all have one source. I just want to focus on the w one word here, fitting. For it is fitting. It was fitting. Let's use some different words to, to describe that. So for it was fitting. For it was right. It was appropriate. It was just. It was fitting. In order for God's sovereignty to stand, in order for his grace to stand, his justice must also stand. It must be fitting. The thing had to be fitting. So all of that evil that occurred, that began at the Garden of Eden, that now has plagued the world, you remember what we said? It's not that way right now. At present, we do not see everything in subjection. It's not like that. All the brokenness of this world, that brokenness must be punished. It must be. Or God is not just. Kids, those of you that have brothers and sisters, you ever see your brother or your sister get away with something? It just feels so wrong, doesn't it? You know? That your, you know, your sister, your brother gets away with something. They did something and mom and dad doesn't know about it. They get away with it. it just, you know why it feels so wrong? Because it is so wrong. That's why. Justice has not been seen. You know why when we watch TV and we see some horrible thing happen. Some guy gets horrible crime and gets off free and is not punished. And we're outraged. I'll write my congressman, you know, and we, it's, it's outrage. You know why we feel that way? Because it's wrong. Justice is a thirst that must be satisfied. Right must be realized. And right now, it's not that way. But God, in punishing sin at the cross, has made his justice real and unchallenged. Stand at the foot of the cross. Look upon God, the Son of God, the Son of Man, hanging there who did nothing wrong. Look at his side being pierced, 
the blood flowing down from his head. Look at that image and tell me sin is not being punished. Hear him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And tell me that justice is not being realized at that moment. It is. God's wrath was being poured out in a way that it has never been poured out before in the flesh of his son, 1 Peter. If you don't believe in the incarnation, neither do you believe in God's justice. Because God's justice is only available if Christ, the Son of God, was born the Son of Man, died on a cross, and was resurrected the third day. So because of this, that is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Jesus Christ walks up to you, Brother Dwayne and Phil, and he puts his arm around you and says, you are my brother. And he's not ashamed to do it. Because he, the Son of God, became the Son of Man. Really, not in some semblance. He really became the Son of Man. And really lived and really hit his thumb with a hammer and really walked around the Sea of Galilee wondering what he's going to eat the next day. He really did all that. So he's not ashamed to call you brothers saying, and then he quotes some, uh, some text to sort of prove his point. I will tell you, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children that God has given me. When we were kids, David and I went to school together, and I asked him if he remembered this, and he doesn't. So I'm a little worried about telling the story because you know how in our minds as we get old we make stuff up. <laughs> but I think this happened, David. I think it did. We had a, a mutual acquaintance in school, a young, a young man by the name of Davy Austin. And Davy was a big farm, corn-fed, big old boy. And uh, I don't remember exactly what happened, but Davy was a bit of a bully. And he was beating the tar out of David on the playground over behind the well house out at the little country school that I attended back in the late 60s, early 70s. And this, if, by the way, if this troubles some of you guys, this is kind of how school used to be. I mean, the boys fought, right, Matt? And I mean, that's, that's what happened at the playground. Those of you that grew up in southern Oklahoma know what I'm talking about. It was a different world than it is now. And so they're out there, and, and David's getting, if I remember right, David's getting kind of walloped. And I stepped in. Now, I would like to tell you that I stepped in and was the hero of the day, but I just don't remember. I just remember stepping in, and I remember Davey Austin being a big old boy, and he was corn-fed. I remember that. And I know why I did that, because my brother was getting whooped on. That's why I did that, right or wrong. Kids do what they do, but I did. I, you know, I walk, I'm walking around, so it must not have ended too badly. Because he's my brother. Christ is your brother. And he's not ashamed to call you his brother. And if you believe that that is true, you must also believe that the Son of God became man and died and was resurrected. Because if he didn't, he, he can't call you brother without shame. He would be ashamed to call you brother. You must embrace the doctrine of incarnation. Now we skipped over the first sentence of this text, and I did so on purpose because it's just one of those, what? What? statements this whole text began for it was not to angels that god subjected the world to come of which we are speaking whoa that sentence is packed full of information first of all he's talking about a world to come from his perspective that would be our final heavenly home the world to come and in offering all the evidence that he's offered about man being made lower than the angels because of death, Christ being made lower than the angels for a little while, and his 
point in trying to drive home to them that Christ is greater than the angels, what he's saying here is that, you know what? The angels are not in charge in, he in the heavenly home. They're not. The angels, the, the world to come, what we think of as heaven, was not put in subjection to angels. But what did the text say about God's creation for us? It is subject to us. We do have dominion. Now, not right now we don't, but the day is coming that we will. Now, I've created a graphic and put some verses below it to try to illustrate sort of, a, we could take a lot of time on this. I'm just going to give you a big picture of what is being said in this sentence. This world that God created originally was supposed to be, we were supposed to have dominion over it, Genesis 1, chapter 28. We were supposed to be over everything that he created. But, as we saw in the text, it's not that way. No, man has sinned. We fell to the temptation of Satan. And as you see, Satan's got the world in his grasp. Ephesians chapter 2 makes it very clear when it says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. This world is in his grip. And if you don't believe it, just turn on the, not the evening news, turn on the evening television show that people watch for entertainment. It's rife with Satan's influence. Just go down to the store and look around. No, you don't even have to do that. Just look in your own heart. And you'll see the powerful claw of Satan as he holds this world in his grasp. He is the prince of the power of the air for now. But Christ came to defeat Satan on his own ground. Got the cross there. I don't know if you can see it. I got the cross right there. So this world is headed towards swift and certain destruction. That's the third image. It's going to be destroyed. God's sovereignty will stand and his justice will stand. Sin will be punished. His mercy will stand because those that accept Christ, that come within the realm of Christ's people, those that Christ calls brother, will, if you will, skip that destruction, be resurrected to live in a new heavens and a new earth, 2 Peter 3. This is the big picture of what the Hebrew author is talking about. And in that final world, the angels are not in charge. They are not. But you know who is kings and priests in that world? We are. Because God's sovereign will created his creation for us to be in dominion over it. And I know that when we think about that, I can't get past my own sin and feel I, I'm not worthy, and I'm not. I have no worthiness in me to, to be at that place in time. None. Only by God's mercy, which is established here as well. The incarnation and only the incarnation can make this truth a reality. All right. So as he sums up, John read this text, he sums up some things. Since therefore the children share, I talked about this last month, since Christ, God, became a man, Jesus, died, went into the grave, ascended back into heaven, and now sits at the right hand of God, you and I have a man on the inside. You remember the story I told about Han and I going to Vietnam, and we didn't have a man on the inside. It didn't work out so well for us. Well, we do have a man on the inside, a man, Jesus Christ, sitting at the right hand of the Father, pleading our cause. We do have a man on the inside, and that's what this text is saying. This was the introduction of what he'll come back to later in chapter, uh, what we were looking at last week, chapter, the end of chapter 4. Jesus Christ, sitting at the right hand of the Father, he is our man, and he is perpetually a human being. He, wouldn't just, he wasn't just a man for 33 years. When he was born as a vir of the virgin birth and became a man, he became a man perpetually eternally a man and now as a man sits at the right hand of the father so you and i have an advocate a friend a brother there man on the inside then he says that through death he might destroy the one who had power of death that is the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery lifelong slavery this world and the brokenness of this world, this fact that we don't have control even of the common cold or my own anger is another way of saying I'm a slave. 
I'm a slave to the infection that Satan has brought into this creation. I'm a slave to that. And the result of that slavery is my death and final and ultimate destruction. Now that's the truth. That's that first world being blown up. That's what it is. Without the doctrine of incarnation. But because Christ came, we've been delivered from that. We've been delivered from lifelong slavery. 1 Corinthians 15 describes it this way. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his foot. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Christ came and when he resurrected from the grave, the victories began to peel off. And those victories are continuing to peel off every time a person is buried with him in baptism. Another victory is found. Another person is saved. Another slave is delivered. The last battle of this war that we're currently engaged in this process we're going through, that we're struggling with, the last battle in this war will be the final resurrection. And Christ is reigning right up to that moment. Reigning till the last enemy is destroyed. You and I need to live in anticipation of that resurrection because we're engaged in nothing less than all-out, full-scale war. A battle against the things of this world and the influences of Satan so that we don't go back to that slavery. But rather we live in the hope and promise of Jesus Christ looking forward to this deliverance. Then he makes another one of these statements that's just shocking. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Now remember his, his big picture point is to show that Christ is greater than the angels. And he says, you know, when Christ came, he didn't come to help the angels. And you might say, what? What's that about? You know, angels fell too. We humans are not the only one that fell. Satan is the first angel to fell, and many fell with him. Ephesians 2, Galatians 3 both describe that. Or rather, Ephesians 2 describes that. These angels fell. Now, how do I become one of the ones that Christ helps? Well, who is it that Christ helps? For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Oh, the descendants of Abraham are the ones that get the help. Yeah, they are. You know what, Brother Mike, I'm not a descendant of Abraham. I'm not either. Not by the flesh. My, my family all ultimately came from northern Europe. And out of what we now know as Iran, migrated up into Russia and across Europe. That's where most of our family came from. We, we have no you know, genetic connection to Abraham at all. So how are we going to get this help? How am I going to get this help that Christ came that he only offers to the offspring of Abraham? Even angels aren't getting it. Well, listen to Ephesians 2. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So it is possible for people that are Gentiles, us, to be brought near and be made a part of the commonwealth of Israel. To be made the offspring of Abraham. You and I can be made the offspring of Abraham. Well, how do I do that? Turn the pages, let me find that text. Galatians 3 explains it. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. When you were baptized in Christ, you came out of that water an offspring of Abraham, looking to, yes, Father Abraham. And you are now a part of the commonwealth of Israel. And you are the one that Christ came to help. What's so awestruck to me, though, is he did not help angels. Oh, the angels fell. 2 Peter 2, God did not spare the angels. 1 Timothy 3, they fell because of pride. Satan did. You see, when the angels who have sinned through the years fell, how many ever times? It's at least two times if you 
follow through the, the scriptural record, it looks like it's at least two times. They're one and done. There's no mercy for them. There's no plan of salvation laid out for them. If they fall, that's it. Eternity of flames. That's it. There is no plan B for them. There is no bring them into the fold. There is no grace. There is no mercy. There is only God's justice. And if you are not an offspring of Abraham, if you have not been buried with him in baptism to become the offspring of Abraham, all there awaits for you is God's sovereignty realized in his justice of your punishment. So when you look at the, t at the uh, manger, the question is often asked, the song that Billy Bob led right before we got up, why does he lie there in such mean a state? The God that created this world, what's he doing there in that feed trough? Why is he there? Because there was no other way to save Randy. There was no other way to save Reese. There was no other way. And he loves us so much that he was willing to do whatever it took. And in this moment where he lies there in such mean a state where ox and ass are feeding, in that moment, the motion the wheels have begun to turn that God's sovereignty is no longer challenged, that his justice is realized and his mercy is poured out on those who will accept it. This morning, we're going to sing a song, and this song is intended to move your heart, that Jesus did pay it all, and in paying it all, made a way for you. We keep the baptistry filled with water just so if a heart is moved, if you come forward this morning, we can see to it that you are buried with him in baptism, that you become an offspring of Abraham, one that God, through Christ, came to help. If you reject it, you are rejecting the incarnation. Don't be a hypocrite and continue to celebrate Christmas. Why? You don't believe in it if you reject it. That's the choice that's before you. If the incarnation is true, you are compelled to act or to say, no, I don't think he's Lord. I think he's either a liar or a lunatic. That's your choice. If we can help you, we, stand, we pray and stand willing and ready to help you. Obey the Lord in baptism this morning. While we sing the song, Billy Bob's going to come forward and sing this song. While we sing this song, take a seat on the front and we'll assist you while we stand and sing.